Thanks everybody for traveling all this way. This is Mike Redderath. He's with the Walker Consulting Group out of the Minneapolis office. Does a lot of design with fiber for parking structures. So, um, Mike, thank you again for coming and I'll let him have the floor. All right, everybody, like uh, Lisa just introduced me, uh, Mike Redderath, I am the Director of Restoration, essentially, so all of our restoration services, which includes building envelope, forensics, and uh, like structural restoration. So today I'll be kind of focused on the, uh, the structural restoration portion with uh, carbon fiber. I'll be giving you an introduction to, to carbon fiber. Um, the date of today's program is December 1st, uh, 22. So our presentation schedule here today is I'm going to do a, a quick introduction to carbon fiber. Um, since this is an engineering portion, um, it's going to be relatively boring, so I'm going to give you a break after uh, 35 minutes here. We'll take a quick five-minute break, let everybody go to the bathroom, refill coffee, that type of thing. Then we're going to move into design concepts for carbon fiber and construction considerations. Then we'll take another quick break and I have construction examples after that. So first of all, what is carbon fiber? So it's a uh, material consisting of thin, strong, crystalline filaments of carbon used as strengthening material, especially in resins and ceramics. Um, that's the primary use for it, and that's the definition according to dictionary.com. Um, it's also used in the construction industry in reinforcing concrete and uh, steel elements. So acronyms that you may run into relative to carbon fiber, you have CFRP, which is carbon fiber reinforced polymer, and that is specific to carbon fiber. So that's primarily what we're going to be talking about today. You also have GFRP, which is glass fiber reinforced polymer, so basically fiberglass. And the photo off on the, uh, the right-hand side here kind of shows these two products really well. So you have the, uh, the darker gray, the, the shinier portion, that is your glass fiber wrapping. And then the vertical black strips, that's your carbon fiber reinforcing. And then just in general terms, FRP is fiber reinforced polymer. So this can relate to either the glass fibers, carbon fibers, or aramid fibers. So we first need to understand where the origins of carbon fiber are from. And this is kind of a unique material um, because I look at it in relative terms to my parents' lifetime, and this was invented after my parents were born. So, I mean, it's relatively a new building material. Um, so, in 1956, uh, Dr. Roger Bacon was the first one to kind of discover uh, uh, fiber, fibrous filaments uh, when he was, you know, dealing with uh, carbon uh, and graphite at, you know, extreme temperatures and pressures, and he was kind of mixing and matching between them. And, yeah, he actually got graphite to go from vapor phase to solid phase in his experiments, which created the first uh, filament, filament of perfect graphite. And that material was really flexible. Um, then in 58, you know, he uh, played around with it even more. Um, he got some of the first, um, you know, high-performance carbon fiber uh, with a tensile strength of 2.9 million PSI. Now we compare this to like standard steel, which is like an A36 grade steel, and you're looking at a, a maximum uh, strength of 79,800 PSI. So it's much stronger than steel is. Um, and then we fast forward another year, and um, Curry Ford and Charles Mitchell uh, patented a way of making fibers and cloths out of this material. So it was a, a very strong material, very flexible, um, so they made a patent on, on that material. And then in 64, uh, the first commercial production of carbon fiber um, began. And they, they used this uh, process called hot stretching, um, and they used primarily rayon um, to make the first carbon fiber. And with that process, it actually uh, took the, the product from like a tensile strength of 2.9 million PSI to 29 million PSI. So it, it you know, the, the more that they worked with the products, uh, the stronger it became and the more efficient it became as well. Um, origins of carbon fiber in construction uh, actually began in Japan. So in 61, uh, a uh, Japanese researcher invented carbon fiber and... Uh, 
the 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 acronym is PAN for the for the material uh, polyacrylate nitrile. Um, so that is what's commonly used today is the PAN product. Um, the the first product that was made um, is primarily used in like uh, the Air Force and things like that military grade products. It's a little bit more expensive. Um, this PAN product has really you know become you know fairly efficient to work with and, and use in construction. And uh, uses now include, you know, embedded reinforcing and concrete construction, and that could be bars or mesh or plates, and then externally applied strengthening, so to existing structures, we apply it in the field after it's built. Tension members and bridges and piers, um, don't think, you know, like Golden Gate Bridge, like the primary cables or anything, but, um, you know, smaller tension members. Um, the nice thing about uh, this being used in bridge construction, it is very resilient to corrosion or anything like that. And then repair of damaged structures. So if you have fire damage to a structure, somebody cuts a PT tenon or things like that. Uh, carbon fiber options. So here are some of the commonly available options. So reinforcing bars, smooth and deformed, um, plates and rectangular bars. Uh, shapes such as the dumbbell um, presenting here today on, on behalf of uh, Rhino and I know this is one of their products. Uh, unidirectional mesh and cloth, again this is uh, by Rhino here, uh, one of their photos from their site. Uh, bidirectional meshes and cloths and pre-saturated meshes and cloths. So um, the, the first two products on this slide are, um, are actually come out dry in the field and then you apply all the resins to the wall, apply the product, and then apply more resin over the top. The pre-saturated ones actually come with the, uh, the, the resin already impregnated in the material. So it's a little bit quicker to install in the field. Uh, it's a little bit messier. Well, it depends on who your, who your labor is, I guess. Do you guys do a lot of specking of pre-saturated? Um, so the question is, do we do a lot of specking of pre-saturated? Uh, a lot of times we use that, uh, leave that up to the contractor in the field. So if the contractor likes using that, um, we will allow them to use that, as long as it meets the performance specs and everything else of the job. Uh, further carbon fiber options, uh, biscuits. So we're gonna, uh, one of my project examples includes biscuits, uh, tubes, and sleeves. So uh, the tubes and the sleeves are very specialty if you need those, um, not commonly used. All right, benefits of carbon fiber in construction. First of all, it's alkali resistant. A lot of what we're applying these to is concrete products. So concrete's high alkali, high pH. So uh, we want something that's resistant to uh, those chemicals. Also corrosion resistant. So this product doesn't rust. It doesn't oxidize. So we... Uh, Love it for that, especially because we're using this a lot in outdoor environments. Low thermal conductivity. So the photo on the right here is showing uh, a thermal break in a steel member. So the steel member wants to be continuous through a building envelope. So it's, you know, the, the portion on, let's say on the left hand side is on the inside of the building, a portion on the right hand side is on the outside. And we want a thermal break in the middle. We also want a thermal break on you know the washers as much as we can separate on there too so that's a good graphic representation of, uh, of thermal break. Um, high strength to weight ratio um, it's very strong and very light I mean you can bring in you know a, a, a piece of carbon fiber that can support tons of material and one person one laborer can, can carry it around the job site very easily. Uh, short curing times so a lot of these are, you know, epoxy-based resins. So they're two-component resins. Uh, you can mix them up real quick. Uh, they start, you know, curing um, very quickly. You can apply this product. You can reopen to, you know, traffic uh, pretty quickly. High ultimate strain. So again, very strong. Uh, it's very lightweight. Um, easily formed in the field. So all of your your meshes and your fabrics. Um, you can take that product out in the field. You can, you know. Form it into a semicircle, a, an L shape, uh, any shape you need for what you're trying to reinforce. Uh, there's also some limitations. So you have the brittle failure mechanism. And one of the uh, most recent uh, 
damages uh, resulting from the brittle failure are some failed double T planks. So in the photo here on the right again, um, this, uh, this precast double T was actually reinforced in the flanges with uh, carbon fiber. And the reason for that was they wanted a product that was not going to corrode and was very strong. Um, what they found, you know, the, the findings are still coming out on it, but it's uh, not very durable in uh, um, fatigue. So you have to make sure that you get your stresses low enough on this material in fatigue so you don't have failures. Um, cost. Um, so the cost is coming down on this product every day. More vendors are getting into the marketplace. It's becoming cheaper and cheaper to uh, manufacture. Um, there's still a labor component in the field um, where you know you have to do all this extra surface prep and everything for this product and then installation and everything else. So uh, cost is still uh, a factor sometimes on this. Um, it is electrically conductive. So we have to pay attention to that when we're reinforcing concrete structures because if there's any connection from the carbon fiber to any sort of metal, um, it, it'll create or, you know, um, essentially enclose that electric circuit and allow for corrosion of the embedded reinforcing steel. And then heat and fire protection of resins. So the carbon fiber itself is actually really resilient to heat. However, the resins that are bonding the carbon fiber to the base product, uh, those are subject to, you know, low, low failures or at uh, low temperatures. And then it requires competent base concrete. So you can't just put this over any junk concrete. Um, you have to have a, a relatively competent base. And then, like I mentioned before, it's labor intensive. All right, so designing of CFRP systems. Um, so this all starts with ACI. So a number of years ago, ACI uh, developed code 440 um, to really encompass all design relative to carbon fiber, glass fiber, um, any, any sort of uh, like a fibrous material that's um, bound or bonded to or encased in concrete. Um, so some of the specific guides, ACI 440.1, guide for design and construction with um, reinforced uh, fiber reinforced polymer bars. So that's basically with new construction. ACI 440.2-17, Guide for Design Construction Externally Bonded FRP Systems and Strengthening. And then I skipped down a few here, ACI uh, 440.11, um, Building Code Requirements for Structural Concrete Reinforced with Glass Fiber. Um, so basically for purposes of this presentation, we're really going to focus on ACI 440.2 um, and go through that. So one of the first things we need to ask ourselves as designers is what do we need the material to do? Um, per ACI 440.2, uh, design options include general design. Or do we need flexural strengthening? Do we need shear strengthening? Uh, do we need strengthening members subject to axial and bending forces combined? Uh, do we need seismic strengthening? Uh, or do we just need confinement? Uh, design considerations for existing structures. Uh, first thing we want to consider is the environment in which this material is going to be performing. So um, if you consider the resins and the carbon fiber together, you know, some of the resins uh, break down under UV light. So we want to make sure that we're either coating those or, or doing something to protect the resins in that, in that case. Um, do we have high acidic or alkaline exposure? So if we're in a chemical factory, for example, you know, you could have acidic or alkaline. Um, if you're bonding to concrete, you're definitely um, having alkaline exposure. Right. Yeah. Does the acidic or alkaline break down the epoxy as well? Or is it just a... Yeah. The, the, considered with a coating on or? the question was, do the acidic and alkaline uh, break down the epoxy as well? Um, the acidic and alkaline primarily interact, yes, with the epoxies and the resins. Um, the carbon fiber itself is, is very neutral, um, so there's not much that, that really affects that. Uh, thermal expansion is a big one. So um, carbon fiber does not expand. It'll actually contract a little bit under the right uh, thermal conditions. So you got to think about that when you're attaching it to a concrete structure because as the structure heats up, 
concrete will actually expand a little bit. Well, if your carbon fiber is not expanding at all, you could actually put your reverse bending into that concrete and put extra stress into your carbon fiber as well. So that's, that's a real big issue, um, especially in, you know, thermally uncontrolled situations such as parking structures or something like that. Um, if, you know, in the Midwest here, we've got a pretty big thermal variation. I mean, we can have 110 degrees in the summertime and we can have negative 40 in the wintertime. So um, down south, I mean, you have uh, higher ranges on the uh, thermal scale. So you have more expansion down there. Um, so you really got to pay attention to that. Now, if you're doing this in an office building where everything's a constant 70 to 72 degrees, um, you don't have to worry about this so much. And then electrical conductivity, we already talked about that. You know, if it's in contact with steel, um, you know, you have to worry about it contributing to the corrosion of the steel. So would there just be kind of like a coating between the carbon fiber and the, the steel? Like yeah, so the question is, do we need a coating between the steel and the carbon fiber? Um, you could do a coating, you could do a um, like concrete cover in a concrete structure. Um, so there are a number of ways that, yeah, you could separate the two materials. Um, but you have to follow the load path then between that base material and the carbon fiber and make sure that the load is still able to transfer through whatever you do. Um, and then other loading considerations, so impact tolerance. You know, is this thing, you know, subject to, to wheel traffic? Is it subject to vehicles possibly hitting it? Do we need to protect it in some, some fashion? And then uh, creep rupture and fatigue. Um, so these are uh, real considerations in concrete uh, over the life of a, a structure. So concrete likes to creep over time. Um, you'll see, you know, older concrete buildings sagging and things like that. Also fatigue, um, where you have repetitive loading and unloading. Um, you really have to pay attention to, you know, lowering your design stresses on carbon fiber so that way fatigue doesn't prematurely fail a structure. Uh, ductility. So typically a concrete structure is ductile. I mean you always think of like a, a concrete structure as being fairly rigid and everything. Um, concrete's very hard, it cracks, that type of thing. However, concrete structures are still ductile. Um, so for example, um, in the, the graphic to the right, we have like a, a pan and joist system on a floor. So if we uh, all of a sudden take a bunch of ductility out of one of those joists because we're adding carbon fiber to the bottom of it, we have to think about, hey, is this thing going to attract more load because now you have a more ductile member next to it that's going to be more flexible and all of a sudden uh, your, your relative stiffness between elements is offset and now your more stiffer element might actually pick up load. So we have to pay attention to that. And then also serviceability. So balancing the strength of the carbon fiber and other reinforcement in the member, which has primarily been steel. So one of the things that they've come up with is limiting the steel to 80% yield strength. The reason for that is if your steel is allowed to come up to 100% yield strength, the concrete will crack and then the, con uh, the steel within it will start to stretch and yield. And after you have a crack form, cracking is, is very bad for the substrate of carbon fiber. So you want carbon fiber bonded to a very competent substrate. So we have to take serviceability into consideration as well. Uh, so we have two different applications uh, with carbon fiber for existing structures. We have bond critical applications and contact critical applications. So bond critical, we kind of talked about a little bit earlier here with, you know, putting coatings in between materials. So if you need, you know, a, a high tensile force on your member that's going through the carbon fiber, you have to make sure that, that is well bonded to the substrate. So that includes surface preparation, it includes putting proper anchorages into the concrete, that type of thing making sure that that is fully bonded. Now contact critical applications, basically you need bond for a little bit while you're laying up the product. So this is for, you know, let's say confinement of like bridge piers or bridge columns or something like that. So basically you're just trying to confine the element uh, within the carbon fiber and make it uh, add strength to it that way. So here uh, within ACI, there uh, these are some really neat graphics relative to shear strengthening that everybody needs to consider when they're designing this. 
So there's different, you know, design standards, whether or whether you're doing completely wrapped systems. So I'm looking at the lower left graphic right now. So if you have a completely wrapped um, system, that is preferred. However, where you have concrete slabs going through, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get elements completely wrapped. Then you have a three-sided or like a U-wrap, um, again, which is secondary preferred. This is what I've seen more in the, in the marketplace is the three-sided U-wrap. And then a lot of times what you do is you put anchors up at the top into the slab. And then you have a, a two-sided uh, wrap last. And then the, the other neat thing with carbon fiber is you can form it different ways in the field. So uh, one of the applications that you can do per figure 11.4 from ACI uh, up on the upper right hand corner is, you know, you can, as you're wrapping the beam, you can put those stirrups, essentially externally bonded stirrups, in a vertical orientation or you can put them at a, a sloped orientation up to 45 degrees. So depending upon what type of strength and, and reinforcing you need, you can, you can change the orientation of those as well. Similar to how you could do steel uh, stirrups within a beam. So the question is, um, why why would you change the direction of the the stirrups? Uh, that's basically all relative to your your shear force and how your structure needs to be strengthened. So um, I know it, it's very practical to put them vertical, and it's very easy in the field to put them vertical. You have a little bit less capacity there, but it's harder to screw up in the field. So if you do them at a, at a taper, you can actually get a little bit more capacity out of them, but your chances of getting it perfect in the field are less, uh, which is the same reason why a lot of times when engineers are engineering uh, steel stirrups in a beam, a lot of times we just show them straight vertical up and down. It's easy to verify you know, the spacing and everything else if they're, if they're straight vertical. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the trade-off between the two. And then we talked about this as well. Do you need to anchor the ends of your CFRP? So, you know, in a bond critical situation, if you can't get enough development length at the end of your, your carbon fiber to actually transfer all the stress from the center of the flexural member out to the ends, um, then you need to consider some sort of like an end anchorage. Um, certainly with stirrups, uh, a lot of times you need pretty significant capacity in the stirrup. So a lot of times with those, you want to anchor uh, the vertical end of that stirrup uh, up into the, you know, either the top of the beam or, or the slab overhead or something like that. Um, one of the things that I have not seen done yet is the, uh, the configuration in the center left on the graphic where you actually have like an embedded bar and you actually wrap uh, the CFRP up over the top of the, the bar that's embedded in there. Uh, personally, I've not seen that yet. I have not engineered that yet. Um, so it's a little bit of a unique situation. It's a bit more difficult than just having a rebarring. Yeah, so the question is, wouldn't it be more difficult to construct in the field? And I agree with that. To, to cut a notch, you know, right up next to a beam and have, you know, a limited uh, depth to it and everything else, yeah, uh, the practicalness of it, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's somebody that's done it better than, than I'm imagining, but um, yeah, I would think that for all practical purposes, that would be a hard install. So, sorry, one more question. Uh, from the diagram on the right, I see that the steel plates are uh, supporting the plane, but I've heard that we still need a coating, or is that not the same? Yeah, so the question is, uh, they have steel plates shown on the, uh, the right-hand side, um, so do you need, you know, a protective coating or, or something over the top of that? Um, yeah, and that could simply be like a galvanizer, so you, you could make it that easy. And also, if you don't have, um, you know, significant moisture exposure within a building, maybe that's more practical, like in an office building or something where you're trying to strengthen, where you don't have, you know, the moisture exposure like you would in a parking structure. Um, this is probably one of the most difficult details to get right from an engineering perspective and in the field. So this is beam column intersections. And they put this 
specifically into the code to get people really thinking about this. Um, so this is kind of where you have, you know, a lot of moment, you know, at a beam column connection. This might be, you know, the way that you're trying to stiffen a structure for uh, seismic applications. You might be trying to add floors onto the top of the building, so now you're introducing extra lateral load into it, and this is like a moment frame. So you're trying to get, you know, some of the lateral taken out into, you know, bending into the beams and things like that. So this detail is is very critical to get right. And I would recommend, if you're an engineer designing this thing, I would partner up with a contractor earlier on, and I would really try to, you know, figure out the best way of getting this detail to work practically in the field so you can engineer it correctly at the beginning and make it as easy as possible uh, once you get out into the field for, for guys to get this, um, get this detail right. Because um, you can see here, you know, typically um, associated with a, a, a beam situation, you typically have floors. So what's not shown in this detail is floor slabs. And if you're trying to get, you know, your CFRP wrap around floor slabs, if you're trying to get, um, you know, bars and or um, uh, plates, you know, through columns or things like that, it's very, very difficult, very labor intensive. So uh, again, you know, try to try to figure as much out in the office as you can um, prior to getting this in the field and make it as practical as you, as possible for the contractor trying to do the work. All right, and one of the questions you're probably having in the back of your mind is, hey, carbon fiber is a great product. Um, if we want to like super enhance any structure, let's just slap on a whole ton of uh, carbon fiber. Well, the, the design code actually put, puts limits on that. So there is a maximum recommended limit that ACI actually has. And this relates to fire ratings, if they're an issue or not. So um, if you have uh, a, a fire rating issue, um, you want to use the equation on the left. And if you do not have a fire rating issue, you can use the equation on the right. So basically what they're trying to do here is, in the case of a fire, your uh, resins are going to lose a lot of strength. And uh, the, the, the fiber reinforcing is going to be, you know, good for whatever because the melting point is so high on that. But you're, as your re resins start losing strength, you could possibly lose, you know, bond of the, the carbon fiber with the concrete. So we don't want a burning building falling down when people are trying to get out of it. Um, especially, you know, if the carbon fiber is, you know, on a, on a critical path, uh, travel path for people trying to exit the building, that type of thing. So uh, we really want to pay attention to these limits. Also, let's say you have a contractor goes in and, you know, just mistakenly cuts a bunch of post tensioning in a floor or even mild reinforcing. You still want to make sure that you have enough base reinforcing intact to support this structure in the event of a fire or um, any other uh, loading situation. So, so there are limits on which, you know, they, they want you to use, um, you know, less carbon fiber um, relative to, you know, the original uh, design of the building. Um, here's typical considerations for beam flexural strengthening. So if you look at a, a, a typical beam, it's a flexural member, um, the top block on the graphic is showing, you know, the, the darkened gray is your compression block of the concrete. Down at the bottom, you have your AS and your AF. So your AS is your area of steel. So that's either your post tensioning or your mild reinforcing steel. And then you have your AF, which is your, um, your carbon fiber that's applied. And they've shown two different considerations for carbon fiber in this graphic. So the graphic on the left is a surface applied uh, carbon fiber. The graphic to the middle left is uh, actually cut in carbon fiber, and Can both. I just read the first uh, carbon fiber. Excuse me, carbon fiber reinforcement on the second graph. Yeah. So the question was, is it just carbon fiber reinforcement on the second graph? And yes, the the AS the steel in there still is the same. It's showing three bars. But yeah, you are using like carbon fiber bars cut in, and those bars could be round bars, they could be flat plate or whatever you need to do. 
Um, before you start cutting into a member, you really need to understand, you know, your concrete cover around your stirrups and everything because you don't want to start cutting through your shear reinforcement on beams uh, just to try to strengthen for flexure. So uh, um, I've seen most often, you know, the graphic on the left um, where you have like a architecturally exposed finish, you might do the, um, the center left um, restoration uh, detail. So, and then uh, the graphics on the right just kind of give the, the engineering uh, terms relative to, you know, where's your compression forces, where's your tension forces uh, within that concrete. And uh, for anybody that's kind of like a lay person out there that's wondering why, you know, you've got like a, like a triangle shown on, on the top right and then nothing shown down below, uh, we assume worst case in construction that, you know, your concrete cracks and then you're just relying solely on your um, reinforcing steel to transfer all that tension force um, uh, versus, um, um, you know, relying on any tension capability of the concrete. All right, so here's, uh, if, if you're watching this presentation, pull out your cell phones right now and take a photo of this um, because you want to make sure that your designer is giving you all of this information. And I think this is important enough to go through line by line here because um, in order to get this right in the field, you got to have it right on the drawings and the specifications first. So. If, if you're not if you're in the field and you're not seeing all this information you need to reach out to the designer of record and ask specifically for all this information because we don't want to screw this up so uh, 15.2 is the section and ACI code for this um, so a is you want to know the FRP system to be used you want to know if it's glass fiber or carbon fiber or whatever uh, B, you want to know the location to the FRP system relative to existing surface. So again, is it surface applied? Is it embedded? How far is it embedded? That sort of thing. Uh, dimensions and orientation of each ply, laminate, or near surface mounted bar. So basically, if you're doing multiple plies, you want to know, hey, I've got two plies on here. Hey, they're mounted back to back on there. Um, or if it's uh, uh, like a near surface mounted bar, you want to know how far that thing is cut in, which direction it's cut in, um, you know, if, uh, and then the orientation as well. Is this, you know, a, a unidirectional product? Is it a bi-directional product? Um, you know, it, it really makes a difference, and I'll, I'll pass around an example here um, for, you know, setting an example of, of like why it's um, just, you know, good for load in one direction. And then uh, number of plies and bars in the sequence of installation. So a lot of times, you know, your, your manufacturer is going to produce one thickness of carbon fiber uh, because it's easy just to crank out a whole ton of one size product. The engineer, you know, is going to look at that and say, all right, for, for force requirements, I need three plies here. Or I need two plies here. And sometimes it might vary by where you're at on the member, too. So if you're dead center on the member, you might have three plies, and as you move towards the end, you might uh, taper that down to two plies and then a single ply. Uh, e, location of splices and lap length. So this is critical. I mean, if you're not installing like a one-piece section of either bar or uh, fiber or, or uh, anything else, you got to know where the splices are, are intended to be and the lap length. So you don't want this product, you know, splitting apart due to inadequate lap lengths or anything like that. Or you don't want to be splicing where your highest stress is, is occurring. And then general notes listing design loads and allowable strains in the FRP laminates. So this will probably be, you know, in, in our documents, it's on the first page where we want to do all of our CFRP notes. Um, and we're going to give that information. A lot of times, too, we will work with a contractor and we'll pick out uh, a particular manufacturer ahead of time and, um, and work with them on, on what are their allowable strains in their material. And then material properties of the FRP laminates and concrete substrate. Um, 
So you want to know, hey, uh, am I working with 3,000 PSI concrete? Am I working with 5,000 PSI concrete? Because if you get out into the field and it's different than what the engineer assumes, you might have to redesign this thing. So, so make sure that you're doing the right thing. Also, uh, material properties of the FRP laminates, um, if you end up switching manufacturers for some reason and the manufacturers have a different uh, material property or strength, then we might have to go with four plies instead of three plies or something like that. So kind of really pay attention to that. And then concrete surface preparation requirements. Um, I know a, a lot of times when I'm working with contractors, this is the number one thing that I'm looking for out in the field. It's kind of like, do I have any sharp edges out there? Do we need to ease the edges? Do we need to fill bug holes? Um, do we have cracks out there? Do, are the cracks leaking? Do we have you know uh, uh, corroding rebar within the concrete? All that stuff. So concrete surface prep is, is critical on this. And then installation procedures, including surface uh, temperature and moisture limitations. Um, so that's really critical uh, up here in the north where, you know, it's the winter time or something like that. You're getting condensation on some materials outside. Um, you, you really want to make sure your, your moisture is limited on this. Critical with um, carbon fiber is you know, if you get any moisture trap behind it, it's going to um, cause blisters in the material over time. So it's going to go into vapor phase and start flying the product off. So you really want to pay attention to that. And then curing procedures with FRP systems. You know, is it, you know, ambient temperature? We were talking about that earlier. Um, down south where it's really hot, I mean, some of these products might kick off real quickly. So you want to have enough staff on site to get this thing installed before the, the product kicks on you. Um, or up north here where you're doing something and temperatures are really low, temperature might be too low for a cure of the material, so then you have to add heat. And then when you add heat, it's, hey, my combustion gases are going to be combining with, you know, the, the curing of the, um, the components that, that go on to the, um, the carbon fiber, so that might actually affect the, the net end strength. So you need to pay attention to all that. Protective coatings and sealants, uh, we talked about that too. Do you have UV exposure? Um, do I have wheel traffic over the top of this thing? So we have to put something protective over the top of it. Uh, shipping, storage, and handling, and shelf life. Shelf life is a huge thing, and I want to encourage every contractor, contractor and supplier, I guess, to pay attention to the shelf life. Um, a lot of times I've seen failures in the field because of uh, the contractor using a product that is expired um, and nobody wants to be in that situation. Um, so check out shelf life. Also, the more control that you have over the shipping, storage, and handling, uh, make sure that you're uh, storing uh, these epoxies and things like that at room temperature, like 72 degrees, getting it into a, a controlled environment. And then uh, quality control and inspection procedures. Uh, and acceptance criteria. So a lot of times you want to do like a mock-up when you're installing like large large areas of this. Sometimes your mock-up might actually be the work that you're installing. So, uh, but for larger projects, you want to do a, a mock-up off to the side. Make sure your crew knows, hey, this is the surface prep that I'm looking for and what's acceptable. Um, you know, if there's any cracks or anything, this crack size is acceptable. Um, the thicknesses of all your resins and stuff like that being applied, get that all done ahead of time. And then uh, in place load testing. So if uh, a load test is required by the engineer, let's know that ahead of time. Let's allow that carbon fiber to cure out 100% and then do some load testing on one area before we move to uh, do the rest of the project. So. Um, we are at about 39 minutes right now. I am going to take a break. All right, everybody, we're back from break here. Um, left off at the requirements for submittals is probably the next important thing. Uh, the biggest thing that I want everybody to know with this slide is just kind of look at overall who's, who's responsible for what. So the biggest you know, uh, this is right out of ACI again. Um, the, the biggest responsibility here is on the FRP system manufacturer. So that's everything in the left-hand column. If you're the contractor, your responsibilities are in the middle. And if you're the inspector, uh, your responsibilities on the right. 
So again, uh, this is very important, so I'm gonna go through this here line, line by line. So this is ACI section 15.3.1 out of the 440. Um, so the manufacturer's got to um, list the indication of compliance with existing specification. And you always want to reference the ACI 440 on that. Um, make sure that, you know, if, if this is a deferred submittal, sometimes the manufacturer is required to partner up with an engineering firm and actually do an engineered design uh, for the loads given by the engineer. Uh, sometimes you have an engineer that knows how to design FRP, uh, carbon fiber, and they will actually do that design themselves. So if you're a contractor, first of all, look over the documents and figure out what needs to be um, uh, supplied as part of your submittals, and then work with your system manufacturer to do that engineering as applicable. And then product data sheets uh, with all the physical, mechanical, chemical characteristics, uh, you want to get all that submitted right away. The engineer is really going to uh, pour through that data and make sure that that is in line with what was specified. And then tensile properties of the FRP system, uh, method of reporting properties, so, um, you know, is it fiber, is it a, a laminate, that type of thing. Test methods used, I mean, if you've got ICC reports and things like that, fantastic, let's, let's see all that data. Uh, installation instructions. So again, like Lisa was bringing up earlier, you know, is this a, a, a wet layup? Um, is it a bar that gets epoxied in place? Is it a, a, a pre-saturated product? Um, so we just need to know what the installation instructions are. ACI gives a bunch of general installation instructions within the code. Um, however, manufacturers, if they can do their own testing and if they have an application method that's different than that, they're certainly free to do that. Uh, manufacturer safety data sheets, um, a lot of times those are uh, required by the contractor on site. They may or may not be required by the owner. Um, if the owner is a uh, large manufacturer, um, they might require that you have all that data on site, especially as it relates to explosions and fires and things like that. Uh, quality control procedures for tracking the FRP materials and material certifications. So again, we talked about, hey, what, what is my quality control of getting that FRP material, especially the resin material, from the manufacturing site to the job site, especially in the winter time in, in North America. Um, durability test data for the S FRP system. So durability relative to UV light or, you know, impacts or, or things like that. Um, or uh, durability relative to, um, you know, frequent loading and unloading or vibration or things like that. Uh, structural test reports. Um, so a lot of carbon fiber manufacturers automatically do the structural test reports just because they want to know what their product is good for. Uh, structural engineers, we also want to see that. And then reference projects are always important. So everybody always has their pet projects that they always worked on. So we want to know what those projects are, you know, how well that installation went, if there's any issues with you know, warranty of the product or anything like that. Uh, the contractor, um, what you're going to want to submit is, a lot of times you're getting this information from the system manufacturer, so it's, it's a pass-through. In addition to that, um, the contractor wants to do the documentation from the FRP system manufacturer uh, of having been trained in the materials. So a lot of times, uh, the engineer, we don't want somebody coming out onto a job site that's never been experienced working with carbon fiber before, all of a sudden installing this component or, or process or whatever, um, just because you have to get everything right in order for this high strength, high performance product to work. So we want to see documentation, you know, where you've been trained or things like that. Um, in isolated incidents, uh, we allow the contractor to be trained on the job site. So if you haven't worked with a particular manufacturer or something like that, uh, please come to the engineer and just say, hey, we haven't worked with this particular manufacturer's product yet. Can we get trained on the job site if it's 100% overseen, that type of thing? Um, I have allowed that a lot in, in my practice. And then uh, project references are really important. You know, so I want to know, you know the size of the projects that you worked on, you know, what products you've worked with. Um, again, 
you know, how well did it go? Is the project clean? You know, um, were there complications with it? That type of thing. Um, and then evidence of competency uh, and surface preparation techniques. I mean, which is, again, I'm going to keep reiterating that that is, you know, one of the most critical things um, with carbon fiber, especially bonded applications. And then quality control testing procedures, um, including voids and delaminations. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, all your voids are getting filled, all your cracks are getting filled, that type of thing before you're um, installing the product. And I've got examples in, in mine. Oh, Lisa. I was just going to ask, can you give some examples on what the what the process is for testing the FRP? Yeah, um, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So the question was, um, are there examples of, you know, testing the FRP? Um, so I do have some of those coming up. And then also very critical, a daily log um, and or inspection forms. Um, so in those daily logs, you know, you kind of want to say what area you're working in, what part of the process you're working on, you know, is it surface prep, are you doing the primer, are you doing, you know, the first application of, you know, uh, like a FRP, are you installing, you know, certain bars in certain locations. You also want to know, you know, the, the temperatures that day, you know, what was the temperature in the morning, what was the temperature at noon, what was the temperature, highest temperature of the day, what was the temperature at the end of the day, just so we can kind of track <coughs> Excuse me. If there ever is a failure, is it related to you know uh, the temperature? Also, moisture conditions during the day. You know, did it rain previously the night before? So we might have high humidity in the morning, or is it high humidity later in the afternoon because you're expecting rain or something like that? Um, so uh, uh, humidity is is you know very critical with these applications as well. So that that daily log really helps you. Be more disciplined as to paying attention to all these factors that go into uh, a proper application of carbon fiber. And then for the inspection agency, um, a lot of times we want an independent inspection agency or the engineer themselves is going to be that inspector. Um, so we kind of really want to pay attention to you know the, the list of inspectors uh, to be used on the project. So a lot of times the engineer is going to have inspection requirements in their specifications and or on the drawings. Um, so we might have it pre-worked out with the owner that, hey, we're going to be inspecting this. So the note might be in the, in the specification that inspections provided by engineer record, that type of thing. So really pay attention to who's doing the inspections. You might have to hire the inspector under your hat, or you might have to coordinate with an inspector that's hired by the owner. So just kind of know who that inspector is. Um, sample inspection forms. So if this is the engineer's project, you know, what is the engineer going to be filling out? If it's uh, a separate uh, special inspector, you know, what does their form look like? Um, some of these smaller uh, testing firms, they might not have everything that you want to see on a form. So uh, make sure you're reviewing those before the project starts. And then a list of all previous projects that were inspected by that particular inspector. So a question, if yep. they don't have a big roster of the projects that they've worked on under their name, is, it, is that a big problem? Because it's something new, like certain experience. Kind of yeah. Experience. So the question is, is it a problem if a person, if an inspector doesn't have experience to get experience, and yes, that could be a problem. So a lot of times what you want to do is you want to partner up a younger inspector or a less experienced inspector with an experienced inspector. Um, you may even want to partner them up with the manufacturers because the manufacturers are going to have field reps and things like that. And I mean, the, the perfect trilogy there is, you know, the designer, the manufacturer and the inspector. So get all three of those working to, you know, make sure your QA, QC process is, is tight and then bring in the contractor too, uh, at the end of that, say, hey, this is going to be our QA, QC procedure, and we're going to work with you to make sure that this thing is done right. So that, that's the best way to, to do that. All right. So we're at the start of construction now. So we've got all the preliminary design done. We've got all of our submittals and everything taken care of. Now we're actually moving into the field. So one of the first things that we're going to do is review uh, the surfaces. And obviously, 
The photo of the concrete here, you don't want to put carbon fiber directly over the top of that because everything's going to fail and it's a waste of the owner's money. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. So um, we want to get out there and make sure that we have competent, you know, surfaces. So get out to the job site and look for unsound concrete. I mean, obviously in the photo, that thing is all cracked up. We're seeing corrosion coming through. Um, we're seeing evidence of active leaking, you know, where there's efflorescence present on that photo. Um, there's no water staining at this time, so there's not active leaking, but there could be just due to, you know, some of the signs in that photo. Um, corrosion is obvious here. Um, and then surface contamination, again, with the efflorescence, obviously, is surface contamination. So basically, in the photo, it's the worst case application for direct, you know, installation of carbon fiber. So just for those who aren't from the concrete industry, efflorescence is the white stuff that's coming out of the concrete as a uh, result of corrosion within the concrete. So yeah, so the clarification uh, brought by the audience was what is efflorescence and in that photo it's the residual white material left on the surface of the concrete and what that is from is moisture within the concrete moving towards the outside faces of the concrete and then evaporating and as that migration happens it's picking up like some of the salts and some of the um, um, other materials within the concrete and it's bringing those to the surface and then as it evaporates it leaves those deposits behind so that's why you're seeing the white uh, white material on the surface um, if you see any of this and it's not specifically labeled on the drawings um, that you are doing repairs in this area make the engineer aware of it um, it's a great change order for the contractor because now you got to do extra work out there hey it's a change order so um, make the make the engineer aware of it. Let's let's get a great install going from you know review of surfaces. All right. So once we reviewed the surfaces and we found you know either the engineer found it or we found it ourselves, um, you, you need to do repairs to that surface. So one of the things is if we've got delaminated concrete, let's just chip out and repair that damaged concrete. So here's an example of a a column where you know if we're doing strengthening around the base of a column let's chip out all that bad concrete let's make sure we're back to sound concrete let's do a competent repair around there um, the rebar in this photo mostly looks good you can see that one little vertical bar um, that has some corrosion on it so we want to clean up that corrosion get some corrosion inhibitor on that and then do our repair over the top of it um, Here's a pretty significant um, underside of slab spall at the edge of a beam. So there's actually an upturned beam on the top side of this uh, condition. So we want a clean coat and or replace corroded reinforcing. So work with your engineer to determine what the limits of corrosion are. Um, so if you're you know, replacing a 20% um, section loss on, on a corroded rebar, um, uh, if you're finding pitting of any sort on like post tensioning, you probably want to address that right away. So kind of work with the engineer on, you know, what section loss is, you know, permitted to where you can reuse the existing steel or do we have to supplement with new uh, reinforcing steel to kind of get uh, back to the same structural competency. Um, and then we want to clean coat and or replace that corroded reinforcing. Um, if we have active leaking wall cracks or wider wall cracks uh, or cracks in beams, cracks in floors, that type of thing, we want to inject and or fill those. Um, so obviously on a foundation wall, you're going to do injection because it's very difficult just to do a gravity fill, that type of thing. So uh, we're going to do ports along preferably each side of the crack and get some injection going in there. Um, we want to stop that leaking. We want to fill the void. Um, and give ourselves, you know, a competent surface to install uh, the carbon fiber. Um, so we talked about pop-outs and or honeycomb and or bug holes, as, as they're called sometimes, um, just where you have trapped air in the forms. We want to patch all that. We want to get the surface as close to as 100% competent as possible. Uh, we want to make sure that it's, you know, free of like any voids or anything like that and make sure that we can you know do a fully bonded system on here um, you can talk to your engineer too uh, some of these 
pop outs and or honeycomb, those may be permitted um, if you just have like a confinement type application. Um, but again, just talk to your engineer on that. Question. Can you define honeycomb? Um, so what honeycomb is in concrete is where you, the contractor has poorly consolidated the concrete. And a lot of times where that happens is you have a fresh truck of concrete comes out of the job site. They get some of the concrete down the chute or whatever. You're doing some testing and stuff like that. Well, the concrete that's in the chute is sitting there for a little bit. And a lot of times it's kind of setting up in the chute. Then you dump that into the form. And a lot of times that's in the very corner of it. And you don't get uh, the vibrator down there. Yeah, yeah. So it's just poor consolidation, basically. Yeah. that we're trying to follow. Yep. So is it one to two, one and two, and like nothing more than two? Because that's what I would have assumed. I'm getting to that too. So, so the question was relative to uh, surface preparation, specifically CSP. I'm going to be getting to that here a little bit in the presentation. Um, so in this fire, uh, in this uh, picture, there is uh, fire damage on here. You can see all the soot and everything um, in the photo, uh, both on the walls and on the ceiling here. Uh, so we want to clean all these surfaces, um, in this case of soot, but also, you know, if you're in a parking structure or some, some sort of outdoor environment, there may be dust on them, uh, maybe cobwebs or, you know, whatever in the facility. Um, again, efflorescence. So it could be, you know, particular coatings on there. Now, again, we talked about coatings previously. If you do bond testing with coatings, you might be able to prove that a certain coating has the, the competency to, to go right over the top of it, or you might find that you have to remove that coating in order to install the, the carbon fiber. And then certainly efflorescence, I mean, obvious indicator of leaking. You want to get that all cleaned up. You want to take care of the cracks, that type of thing. So checking crack widths. So specifically in ACI, we want to repair cracks that are 0 0.01 inches wide or wider. So here I am uh, in the photo, I am actually checking a crack that I found in a beam. I mean, sometimes these cracks are very hard to find. Um, so you're going to look for everything that you can out there. And then you want to take a, a crack comparator and actually look at how wide those cracks are and repair them. So the automatic is anything 0 0.01 wider, wider, you're repairing. A lot of times that's like an injection process. However, if you're in a high moisture environment, um, let's say some parking garages, that type of thing, where you might expect moisture to come through cracks, you might even want to fill cracks that are even smaller than that. So again, verify with your engineer, verify with the manufacturer that we're okay with the 0 .01 um, crack width for repair. Here's the surface preparation question. So we want to check that surface preparation, surface roughness profile. So the International Concrete Repair Institute has chips, and you can take these chips out to the job site. So as any good engineer has, I've got uh, a sample of the CSP chips, uh, surface profile chips, with me. Um, I put a little clip on the one for CSP3. Uh, that is the standard per ACI requirements is the CSP3. Um, you can work with your uh, manufacturer if they want anything more or less. I was ref uh, looking at one manufacturer's data and they said CSP3 or better. Well, what's better? Is, is something that's more rough better? Is something that's more smooth better? What's or better mean? So if I say CSP3 or CSP2 or CSP4, I mean, I know specifically what I'm getting at, so I encourage all the manufacturers to look at your data and be very specific about the surface profile that you will allow with your product. So I'll pass these around here real quick. Well, so the question is, are the manufacturers going to be consistent? Uh, and that question is, I don't know. Um, it's all relative to when they do their testing in the lab and they're getting their approvals. Um, whatever they test in the lab for is exactly what needs to be reproduced out in the field. So if it's a CSP3 that they created, if it's a CSP2 they created, that has to be recreated out in the field. So it's very critical for the manufacturer to address that in their data 
and specifically uh, uh, log it. Joel. Sure. So uh, for the recording purposes here, we have a contractor in the audience, and he did verify that, yeah, typically three is your most aggressive surface profile, and they do vary by manufacturer. So he's seen them uh, two to four, uh, CSP two to four surface roughness as required by the manufacturer. So again, you really want to pay attention to that. And he was also stating that a lot of times you do not want a more aggressive surface profile just due to uh, the potential for air voids and things like that to occur behind the product. So thanks for that, Joe. Um, so here we're talking about um, layout and bond testing. So you want to make sure that you have enough material to do the job. So kind of do some dry layouts when you get started. So, you know, get everything laid out, get it all prepped. Um, and, and make sure that once you start, you're ready to go on the job. Also, you can see on the photo on the right, here we're looking at a painted beam. And we, we've talked about this before in the presentation that, um, you know, any coatings or anything like that could be like a bond inhibitor. So we actually want to get out there. We want to glue a puck onto the surface. We want to test that actual coating to see if it's got enough bond to actually transfer the load uh, between the, the carbon fiber product and the base concrete. Um, in this case, and I'll, I'll show this later on in, in our demonstration, um, this particular test failed. So, um, so we had to remove all the paint or whatever coating it was uh, from, the, from the beam. Yeah, so the uh, question from the audience is, um, what bond is typical on this? And uh, uh, specifically, you know, is it 200, is it 300, is it 400? Um, that really varies by the application. So, well, uh, so the question is, is that low relative to what we're doing? Um, the answer to that is, it's really relative to, let's say um, you're putting carbon fiber on the bottom of a beam to reinforce against uh, flexure. Well, there's a lot of stress in that at the very end of that. By the time you get out to the ends, you're kind of dissipating all that stress. So if you're taking 200 PSI times, you know, the width of the beam times the length of whatever you need to do, um, that may be adequate. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you do need, you know, the 300 or the 400. And then you have to question, hey, is the epoxy good enough to achieve that? So a lot of times what, what we'll have the contractors do is we'll have them extend the repair out, like maybe two, three, four inches and then we'll do our, our field test on the end of that product at that overrun location and we'll actually field verify you know that bond in the field so so that way we're ensuring that along the length of that thing we're actually getting what we need now uh, we also talked about earlier in the presentation too that you might need a, a end anchorage like a, a physical mechanical anchorage so if we're not getting enough bond capacity or we don't have enough run out distance to like get that, that load dissipated, then we might have to do some of those mechanical anchors. So it works. Question? No, just making sure. Oh, okay. All right, so now we're preparing for a material installation. So, you know, the manufacturer's done their job of getting the products to, um, to the contractor. Contractor has, you know, done the proper climate controls and everything for maintaining all these components. Now they're bringing them to the, to the job site. So if you're going to have these materials on the job site for multiple days, make sure that, you know, there is climate control, like actually on the job site. Um, if you have to provide like a job trailer or something like that with mechanical air conditioning or heating or things like that, please take that into consideration, especially if the job is remote and away from your warehouse. Um, if the job is close enough to the warehouse, you might just be able to take the product that morning out of the warehouse, put it on a truck, get it to the job site and then use it that day. So really look at how you're storing those materials. Um, and then especially in unopened containers, because a lot of these containers, as soon as you open them up, um, the product starts reacting with things that are in the ambient environment, such as moisture. So we really want to make sure that you're, you're using unopened containers. And then we want to make sure that that uh, carbon fiber is clean. So in the previous photo, you know, I was showing you that they had the acetone set to the side already. So we want to make sure that we do like a solvent wipe or whatever the manufacturer requires 
to clean that carbon fiber product prior to using it. And then also provide surface protection as necessary. So that surface protection can be for the carbon fiber material itself. It can be for you know adjacent surfaces. Uh, we also don't want to make a mess of everything. Or, and we don't want contamination of the product. And then I, I kind of made this point earlier too. Make sure the crew is large enough to handle the job in a timely manner. And then provide them with the safe, uh, proper PPE, which usually includes gloves as a minimum. Um, if you're doing overhead work, I mean, consider goggles, uh, cons consider Tyvek suits. I mean, you want to be completely covered because this crap, when it gets on you, it's very tough to get rid of. And it might cause a chemical burn too. So, I mean, you really want to make sure uh, you know what you're dealing with. You want to protect your crew. And then also I mentioned before, you know, if this is a very hot time that, that this material is going down, uh, you might have to refrigerate the product on site. So you want to pay attention to that because um, as soon as the chemical reaction starts within the product, it's going to heat up itself. So you got the ambient temperature plus the heat of, you know, the curing. I mean, this stuff can kick off real quick if you're not paying attention to it. And if the product starts to kick, I mean, you got to have a lot of crew on site to get that thing, you know, all the epoxy down and everything, get the product in, and then you still got to roll it out and make sure there's no air voids in it. So, I mean, you might have a pretty large crew out there, which again contributes to the cost of, um, of these systems. And then um, installing it. So verify the, uh, the mixing ratio of the primers. Um, so a lot of these things I've seen, I think all these, Joe, I think they require a primer. All of them do, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's not like an optional thing like uh, some traffic coatings and that. So, so you want to get your uh, surface prepped, and then you want to put down your primer first. Uh, verify the mixing ratio of that primer. Um, a lot of manufacturers have dumbed that down already by having, you know, certain size pails um, and then you have a part A component, a part B component. So I have in my slides coming up, I, I actually have, you know, verification on site of each of those. Um, so you want to want to do that. Look at the application of, you know, your, your primer. Do you want to do uh, like a trowel applied or can you do a trowel applied? Does it have to be a roller? Does it have to be a brush? Um, know how you're going to apply it and then check the the wet mill thickness so the biggest part of this thing that I want you guys to know too is check your wet mill thicknesses in the field so you don't want too little uh, because then the product may not bond as well uh, you don't want too much because then you're wasting product and or you might not get a decent bond either so I mean you got to be in that that happy zone you know where it's you know just just about perfect to where uh, the manufacturer wants it. Yeah, so the uh, question is for um, engineering calculations, do we want to verify the uh, laminate thickness? Um, our calculations are based off of manufacturer's data. Um, so whatever we specify, it's going to be off of that. So not so much for the engineering end, but for the testing end again. So if they tested per a particular wet mill thickness, that's what we want to install in the field again. Yep. Um, and then the resins, as we're putting resins on, so you got your primer on, that's all set and ready to go. You want to make sure, uh, too, if you need the primer to be tacky, if you need the primer to be fully cured, whatever the uh, manufacturer's requirements are on that. Then you want to put on your, your first layer of resins, um, you know, check with the manufacturer again. Again, mix those things. That's a part A, part B type thing too. Make sure you're uh, doing everything per proper ratio. Otherwise, you might not get proper cure on the product. Um, and then again, check the application thickness, wet mill thickness gauge. And then install your carbon fiber product. So whether it's a, uh, a like a sheet product or a, a fabric product, or whether it's a um, like a bar or um, or a plate or something like that, you want to install that. You want to roll out any air bubbles. Um, so you want full contact. You want full impregnation with the uh, um, the resins, that type of thing, and you know get this thing fully engaged, and then firmly press on it and uh, make sure it's uh, installed fully to the the substrate. And then you want to install your top layer of resins as required. Again, 
roll out any air bubbles um, and you know verify wet melt thickness gauge. So where you want to verify your wet melt thickness on here is after the contractor gets it fully rolled in, make sure that we got enough product um, remaining over the top of the, the product. And then wait for the products to cure. Um, again, manufacturers are going to have a certain cure time. Cure is also dependent upon ambient temperature, ambient moisture, that type of thing. So this thing may kick off uh, faster or slower relative to ambient conditions. Um, we talked about heating uh, enclosures if needed. Um, so again, pay attention to the heat that you're using. A lot of times we recommend electric heat because electric heat is pure. There's no off gassing or anything like that. No combustible gases, that type of thing in the atmosphere. They're going to react with um, the, the resins and that um, as they set up. So really pay attention to heating and also when you're heating, Make sure the temperature within the environment is up to heat. Make sure your substrate is also up to heat. So you could be putting this on a really cold substrate and it could drastically affect the cure rate of the product. And then testing, um, we talked about this as well, you know, extend the ends or the sides of the product and that way you can get a true bond test in the field of the completed installation. So as an engineer that gives me the, the most warm and fuzzy feeling to know that what got installed is actually um, perfect. All right, um, we're gonna take a little break here. We're very near the 35 minute mark. Um, I'm gonna talk about you know three specific construction examples here coming up. Uh, we're gonna take another quick five minute break, thanks. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got a, uh, uh, a crack mender, um, crack lock product in front of me right now um, and it's, yeah. And yeah, so these are the equivalent of a biscuit uh, as produced by Rhino. Um, so uh, the manufacturer on these, so there's a carbon fiber web in the middle, and then on each end there's a, a carbon fiber uh, bar that the fiberglass bar. Okay, so it's a fiberglass bar on each end that's wrapped with the carbon fiber, um, and this thing is about a foot long. Okay, give or take. Um, so when I look at this thing, you know, I see a great, you know, tension member. So, I mean, there's a lot of tension capacity here. You've got, you know, your lock-offs on each end. You know, the lock-offs are far away from any crack, you know, assuming that this is centered on the crack. So you're not going to get, you know, that brittle failure like we saw in this, that tension failure. Um, so, so that would hold extremely well in that. Uh, what I would question on this, you know, the, the thickness of the material, you know, what's the shear capability? In this plane. So if I loaded this here, it goes the other way though. Yep, I understand that. But for replacing a, uh, a a biscuit, so if you're installing this this way, yep. So let's say thermally you're expanding and contracting in this way. I see this being a very good product for that. Um, the one thing you might want to check is so a typical gap on precast is about an inch. Uh, some of it's a little bit tighter. Some of it can go to like an inch and a half. So I guess maybe if you guys were to test this thing. I would take like a half inch and a half maximum gap and uh, I would specify probably like a one inch gap up to half inch and a half and then I would test that in compression. So yep yep so so my thought process on this for a precast double T if you install this in the uh, in the early morning when everything's fairly cool or in the springtime up here, everything is going to be, you know, fairly contracted. Then, as you get to the middle of the summer, middle of the day, whatever, everything's going to heat up. The concrete's actually going to expand, and there is going to be a compression force put on this member, and that's going to be over that inch and a half. So, if you test it at an inch and a half maximum width, that's going to give you your uh, biggest slenderness ratio. Um, so, your uh, or yeah. So, so basically your L over R, uh, so if you're doing like a concrete equation or whatever, um, you're going to have your biggest chance for buckling uh, with that scenario. So I would actually test it in compression just to verify, hey, this thing is competent for X amount of compression. And I don't know if that's 200 pounds, I don't know if that's 1,000 pounds, whatever it is, but I would test it just so you have the data. Then 
you have to chest, uh, test it for, so it's installed in this, this configuration for a double T. Then you have to test it for, you know, load transfer in this, this situation. Um, again, I would leave probably an inch and a half gap in between there and then test that thing. So that way you're going to get a little bit of bending in between there as well as shear and see what the, the values are for that. And then I would test it in and out of plane in this direction. So if I have wind blowing on a, on a building and my diaphragm action's kicking in, this precast member and this precast member, they can't move independently. So what does that shear transfer have to be in order to resist the wind load? So I need to know that value as well. So I would test all, well, four of those. So it's tension, compression, load vertical, and load horizontal. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the comments from Rhino here was uh, there's interest from the DOT as far as mending cracks in highways um, relative to, you know, repairing the crack and, and transferring load between there. Um, also, um, you know, getting this product approved for use in fixing uh, double T flange connectors. All right, so I am going to go to uh, another one. Um, so we've got a little bit of time left here. Um, I'm not going to get to my third one. I can tell you that already. All right, so this uh, is a button head post tension pan and joist uh, repair over in St. Paul, Minnesota. So this is an older structure, um, you know, uh, late 70s construction, or I should say early 70s construction. Um, so the button head uh, pan and joist system is uh, very unique. Uh, it's one of the first... Uh, first uh, post-tensioning systems used up here in the Twin Cities area. So a little bit of background on this thing. So we had a restoration project going in 2016, and we were doing standard repairs at beams and, and slabs, and all of a sudden we discovered multiple broken button head joists uh, post-tensioning tendons in a row. Uh, so we needed to, I, I was the engineer on this one, and I required shoring uh, immediately on this thing. It was three... Uh, three separate uh, button head joists in a row. Now, for those of you that don't know uh, the difference in post-tensioning systems, uh, PT systems for short, um, one of the original systems was uh, the button head system. And it got its name from uh, the buttons that are formed uh, in the factory on the end of the post-tensioning. So typically, uh, the manufacturer of these systems would know you know, the overall dimensions of the uh, project, they would pre-manufacture all these things in the factory, and they would ship them out in huge coils out to the job site. The contractor would just uncoil them out there, and then uh, the, the lug on the very end is, is threaded. So there would be a jack that connected onto the end of this. Your buttons would keep the wires from pulling through that lug on the end, and this essentially would be stretched in the concrete. The, uh, the thing that they used initially to keep bond from the individual wires to the concrete was paper. So you can imagine that's not very durable for salt exposure and water exposure in the northern United States. So what happened with a lot of these systems was as this would crack over time and water would get into the system, you have just basically uncoated uh, steel that's just open for corrosion. Um, since this is high strength steel, the corrosion mechanism is pitting rather than like corroding and blowing up, you know, expanding exponentially. Um, so you get pitting, and as soon as uh, the pitting is so severe, these wires are going to start popping. So what we found is, um, and then the other thing too is to lock this thing off, you essentially stretch this thing to the manufacturer's required elongation, and then you put shims in here to shim in between this head and the, the, uh, the compression plate in the concrete. And then once that's uh, done, you release your jack, the tension stays on this, and then you encase this whole thing in concrete. So that's how, how this system worked. You compare this to modern post-tensioning, and this is a monostrand system. So the monostrand system, it's seven wires and they are tightly wound together. So, you know, very little place for water to get into. Also, you have an extruded sheathing on here. So the extruded sheathing goes from end to end on this. 
and there's very little chance for water to get in there. One of the other advents was the encapsulation system of your anchorages. So this particular system is older. This is like an 80s version. Um, so this uh, anchorage is not encapsulated. The current ones have plastic all the way around uh, this anchorage end. And on the end, after you get done stressing this, there's also a grease cap that goes on the end. So basically, there's no way for water to get in to this assembly and start to corrode it. Also, the sheathing does two things. So it provides that bond break between the concrete and the steel. It also wraps all your grease and everything in there. So they started developing better and better greases for protecting all this. So any voids that are in this, in between these wires, are now all filled with grease. And now the manufacturers are even starting to, uh, or have been putting in corrosion inhibitors into that grease and the uh, chemical consistency of the grease is getting better, so it it's, doesn't break down as readily in high temperatures and that type of thing. So these systems are getting better all the time, which is bad news in the repair industry because we're not going to be fixing these things as much. However, we know that there's many structures out there that are older systems, so we're going to be good for a while. All right, so that's the history on post tensioning real quick. All right, so this is a button head system, that first system. So when we found those broken post-tensioning tendons, we shored that up. The next question we had is, how many of these actually exist in this entire facility? So we talked to the owner, and we said, we would like to do a destructive investigation program. And we started testing likely areas of corrosion. And you know, we, we just said, hey, we're going to look at 1% of them. We're going to look at the worst, worst case areas. And we started opening those up and we found quite a bit. So we said, all right, let's extend this program. Let's look at other areas that are in good condition as well as areas that are in bad condition so we can give a fair assessment to this owner instead of just looking at worst case scenario throughout, you know, what, what repair costs we're actually looking at on this thing. So we, we did the destructive investigation program. What we found was, you know, yeah, there's a bunch of broken post tensioning in here. However, the cost of replacement versus cost of rehab uh, was way different. So it was going to be much cheaper to rehab this building in place than to replace it. Um, some of the characteristics, too, were, you know, this structure is partly underground. On the top level of this thing, we had a plaza deck. Um, it's tied in with, like, a pool structure and everything else. So, I mean, to, to lose this entity for any amount of time was going to be a big deal for the owner. Plus, parking downtown uh, St. Paul is a big deal, too making sure that you have enough parking for your tenants is, is important. Um, so after we did that, we put a restoration program in place that started in uh, early 2017. Um, obviously, the owner wasn't going to run out and get a huge loan for making all these repairs at one time. So we are incrementally going through you know, the worst areas first and then uh, continuing repairs. So this project is still ongoing yet today. And even you know next year, we're already talking with the owner about getting uh, the, the program in place for next year. Um, so we already talked about, you know, the eight wire uh, paper wrap button head PT system. The, the re repair approach that we were doing was we were actually pulling that out of the paper wrap sheathing. We're going back in, cleaning that void out, and then we're sticking in a 0.6 diameter monostrand. So this example that I have with me, this is a half inch, a 0.5 monostrand. Um, so the 0.6, if you imagine it's a little bit bigger around, uh, we were able to work with the contractor to get the sheathing and the tendon pushed back through these voids. Um, so that way we can replace with a fully encapsulated system into the existing vacant ducts, if you will. So, so that worked out really well. However, if you look at the overall cross-sectional area of this, this monostrand is significantly less in cross-sectional area to the eight individual quarter-inch wires of the button head system. So we're losing capacity by doing the repair this way. So how do we enhance the capacity? We introduce carbon fiber and, and other things to compensate for this. So we ran some calculations on the backside. Hey, how much strength, strength loss do we have? Conveniently, you know, the original structure was designed for 50 pounds a square foot live load. The code now has changed for parking structures, and it's 40 pounds a square foot. So we got to take advantage of the reduction in uh, code required loading for the structure combined with the, the decreased amount of um, 
uh, post tensioning that's present in the structure per the repair. And we had enough balance in there as we were talking about, you know, in the code review that we can actually do this repair and put carbon fiber in this structure. So, um, so that's the backstory in general. So our first repair project was very simple. I mean, we only had basically three work items. Uh, we had the uh, general conditions of the contractor, which are, you know, for mobilization, permitting, uh, testing, that sort of thing. And then we have uh, three work items. We're doing post-tension repair, uh, extraction and threading. That's for a joist. We have another one for a beam. And then we have isolated tension, uh, tendon extraction and threading. So we've got the three work items. And basically, we're going through the structure and doing this foot by foot, depending upon where, where the work is located. So here's a typical floor plan of the larger floor plates uh, for this uh, project. So you can see here, we're doing a lot of work. Um, so the main girders are crossways in the photo, and we're repairing all of those, uh, uh, pulling out broken post tensioning as encountered, replacing the 0.6 monostrand. We're putting carbon fiber on the bottom centers of those girders. And then on the top, um, the, the first repair that we were doing is we're actually embedding, you know, cutting in slots and trenching in uh, steel rebar. Um, to, to install over the top. And then we have in the other direction, we have joists. So again, with the joists, you know, we're putting, um, I don't think we had to put carbon fiber on the center of the joist on the bottom. We just had to trench in some bars on the top. So, so this is uh, the repair. Specifically, here's the detail that we came up with. Um, so you can see here, you know, as you come to the end of the beam, uh, we had uh, one top top size uh, repair there, uh, the carbon fiber went on the bottom, and we'll look at detail 21.5.2, and then we had the other uh, uh, top repair um, of cutting in the mild steel over the, the beams at the columns. So here's our overall detail uh, that 21.5.2 I was just talking about. So this tells the contractor, hey, it's, we're expecting to find a four foot wide girder out there, and you're going to put carbon fiber over the width of that. So um, we have the note over there, um, install one layer of CFRP at beam soffit, 15 foot long, centered at beam mid span. So, you know, we're being very specific with the contractor, what we're installing, where we're installing it. And then this ties in with the specifications too, and the specifications specifically call out, you know, what manufacturers we're looking for, you know, the minimum thicknesses of carbon fiber and that type of thing. Um, we put further information in detail 21.5.3. So we get over there, and this is basically a blow-up view of what we're expecting the contractor to install. Um, so again, this is not to scale at all. We're just giving a graphical representation of what we're installing here. Um, so we have the existing concrete beam soffit. So right over here, um, minimum grind high spots to and fill voids. So again, we're, we're talking about the surface preparation. We want an even surface. Um, and then uh, we talk about the crack injection here too. So I mean, we're even though it's in the code, we want to reiterate it. We want to put it on drawing so that way the guys in the field all, all have this. Um, and then we want to do our primer. And uh, the, the paint goes on the very top. And then the owner is going to do the paint. Um, and then uh, fully impregnated C CFRP. Um, so that's kind of the detail. And then um, also the notes, grind corners round, we talked about that, three quarter radius minimum as required. So, you know, I don't think we ended up grinding any of the corners on this because none of the carbon fiber wrapped around the edges of the beam. But we put the note on there just in case. Um, and then, yeah, C specs. So that's on the bottom. On the top side, I talked about, yeah, epoxying in uh, the bars at the columns. So that's the detail there. Um, we're showing the post tensioning deeper in the slab. We're showing, you know, how shallow um, those bars are actually mounted at the surface of the concrete slab uh, at the column. Here's the detail at the outside end. So since we're changing up the reinforcing system, we had to tear out the existing anchorage for the buttonhead system, put in a new anchorage for a monostrand system, 
So we had to pocket out the end of these joists and the beams and, and swap out all that hardware on the end. Also, we had to reinforce with that hook dowel. Um, so you can see that hook dowel fall out number seven L bar. Um, so we needed that hook to get the development length uh, of that steel. So here's a photo of all the work being installed at the column. So this is all the post tensioning repairs. Um, we have in the photo here, uh, you can see what's called a dog bone repair. So this is a center stressing repair. So basically you put your jack on there instead of stressing from the end, you're stressing from the middle and that's pulling from both directions then. Um, once these repairs are done, everything's wrapped up and this is buried in concrete. So this is a photo of once that repair has been made at the, the column, the concrete is cured, uh, the contractor then cuts out these grooves and here you can see that they are dry fitting the bars into the groove before they uh, dig out the epoxy. So, so that's exactly what's going on in this photo. Uh, they epoxy all that in. This is a uh, detail and you can see how confined this thing is. So the contractor did a great job of getting all of our detailed steel into these pockets at the end of the beams and at the end of the joints. And you can see that number seven bar, you know, the big bar in here going through and hooking down. So uh, kudos to the contractor on this. They did a great job. Uh, we loved working with them and same contractor still on the job today. Now we move to the carbon fiber. So this is the carbon fiber prep with the main, uh, main beams on the underside of the main beams. So first thing I look at is, all right, have all the voids been filled, bug holes, you know, whatever. Um, and I look for that. Second thing I do is I start looking for these small cracks. And I've got my crack comparator. It's the same photo that I had earlier in the presentation. I'm measuring all those cracks, making sure, hey, it's, it's smaller than what's, you know, required uh, for, for repair. Repairing these things as needed. Uh, next thing I want to do is I want to verify the components that are out on site. So I talked about earlier part A and part B. Uh, this manufacturer has already pre-sized the, the buckets for proper mixing on site. So it's easy to mix the stuff up and you're ready to go. So as a manufacturer, kind of dumb it down for the guys in the field. Uh, it's easier for guys like me, you know, that are doing the inspecting. So it's like, you just go out there, hey, these guys are doing it right. Uh, and then you got to verify, you know, is it paddle mixer? Or what, what's the mixer? You know, you don't want to be whipping air into these systems, that type of thing. So you have to look at some of that as, as that occurs. So here, uh, again, I mentioned before, you know, the bond testing. So this was painted white. So you can kind of see the end of the white paint up here. We had that 100% removed. Uh, we had surface profile of three verified. And now uh, the contractor, you can see the, the darker line here. That's the primer already on. So they're going through and priming this thing. Um, here's a more up close view of it. So the primer's in place. You can see the duct tape at the end of the uh, application. So they don't want to get any of this product, you know, beyond where we're trying to install it. So a nice clean end uh, to, the, to the repair. You can see some of the, uh, the epoxy that has been spread on there to, you know, fill a bunch of those bug holes, a uh, bunch of, sometimes there's like form marks and stuff like that on there. So you got to grind some high areas and fill some low areas. So you're, you're taking care of all that ahead of time. So they're getting ready to put on the carbon fiber. So we verified what they had for the actual carbon fiber. And then we also verified uh, the saturant. And again, saturant. So, so again, you know, it's, it's a bigger bucket. It's a five gallon bucket. And it's a, so we've got, that's the saturant product. And then we also have putty. So this is the putty that they actually use to, to fill any of the voids with. So uh, again, a part A and a part B on this. So verified all that. Now, um, this is a photo of them actually installing this. And again, you can see, you know, three guys just in this photo, uh, they're going through a, a, a fairly small area and you can see they left some pipes, you know, sprinkler pipes in place, could be drain lines. I mean, you could be working around stuff. Um, so the blue is, you know, some of the base saturant that they already put down. Uh, the black that they're rolling out is the carbon fiber. Um, so they're making sure that they're getting it continuous and everything from end to end. Um, again, we, we specify that this thing is continuous from end to end for that, for that whole length. 
So once they get put into place, you can see the guy here, he's using a roller, he's, you know, getting that uh, uh, saturant, you know, basically pressed into uh, the carbon fiber, making sure that all the air voids are taken out of it, um, doing a really good job to ensure full contact. And then here is the, uh, the finished product um, with the top layer of saturant applied over the top of it. And then, again, for special inspections, you know, I have my wet mill thickness gauge. That's what's in the photo there. And basically, I'm dipping that into the product, and I have, like, a white sheet of paper out, and I'm, and I'm stamping it on the, on the surface of the material, and I'm stamping it on the surface uh, of my notebook, and then I'm laying it down there so that way I can see exactly what the wet mill thickness of the material is and making sure that they have enough product on it. And then the overall uh, product when it's done. So... Different manufacturers have different colors that they include with their epoxies and things like that. So this particular one was blue. Um, and then the owner comes back and the owner puts, you know, paint over the top of this thing. So uh, for this Kellogg Square product, project, lessons learned, you know, we spent a lot of time up front on this project, you know, making sure that we, we know of pretty much every condition that's going to be out there. We've got the engineering done. Um, we pre-engineered this one, so we told uh, the contractor, you know, what to, to bid specifically. So that way there was no engineering on the tail end of this thing. Um, so, so we did that. Um, you know, the, the bidding was really good from the contractors. Um, you know, once we moved into the field, we found that, you know, pretty much everything was in line with what we were expecting. Um, again, having an experienced contractor is vital to the success of the project. I mean, this contractor got on board. Um, I mean, just a fantastic job uh, start to finish on this thing. And the owner was appreciative of it, too, which is why they're still the contractor that's on site today. Um, and then the design didn't catch the one thing. So we have beams going in one direction, joists going in the other direction, and where we have to reinforce the tops of them, we didn't catch that. So uh, one thing that we had to modify in the field was, instead of doing the embedded bars in both directions, we ended up grinding down uh, and putting carbon fiber over the tops of beams in some locations. So your, your primary uh, concern is the beam strength. Secondary concern is the joist strength. So your joist got, you know, the, the reinforcing, the joist got put over the top of the beam reinforcing. So that was the one thing we didn't catch early on, so we ended up doing a, a minor change order on that. Um, since this was done, like, well before COVID, I mean, we didn't have problems with... Um, um, you know, product availability, that type of thing. Um, budget and bid early enough uh, to avoid product delays. So this thing, you know, is bid in the winter time. weren't doing the work until the spring. So plenty of time for the contractor to get all the products in line and submittals. And so that went extremely well. And then, um, you know, require full-time inspection of the carbon fiber installation. Um, so we found some bubbles appeared after this install, um, there are allowances by the code and by manufacturers for, you know, anything less than a quarter um, and then a certain number of them within like a square foot area. So when you're, when you're out there, don't expect to uh, find like a perfect install on every job. Expect to find like a few, you know, small areas that are debonded or whatever, and then just record those and see if it's in compliance with the codes and the manufacturer's recommendations. So, so that's, uh, that's all on that one. I'm a little bit over time, but does anybody have any questions on that? All right. Folks are hungry, so uh, we're going to call it. So thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, the attention to that, and uh, we'll call it good. Thank you much.